last year you spoke about a new tree that you're introducing with qualified genealogy stuff. Yeah. I was just wondering what progress you've made and where that stands and the rollout, etc. Yeah, yeah, we've done a whole bunch of work and listening to uh, to our customers and our users um, over the last year. So we evolved and iterated. We're still working really hard on on our tree, on, on building easy experiences that that work for the newest users and also work for all of you and for more experienced users. So. Our tree remains, it remains with the personal element and also has collaborative and community elements in it. And we think that you know, bringing those two spaces together, uh, so for an example, is our tree to tree things that we've just launched. Those work within a personal environment where people, where people can choose, I want to use this or I don't want to use that. I'm happy, I'm happy to take the work of others and, and, and have that informed or not. And that's kind of how we're seeing trees working towards the collaboration and community elements can be really important if you want them, but we're not going to force them on you if you don't want them. And we think that creates the best experience for, for everyone. But keep watching, you know, during the year, there's some, there's some really exciting developments on top of the and so on that are, that are coming on. But we've been amazed, I mean, internally, the, um, the, the, you know, so many of, of actual, we were testing tree to tree in beta. We all have really well developed trees. You know, we have so, uh, we have such rich, UK key data, but some of us are finding things from that sort of massive you know, database of new countries that have never been exposed to before um, that we didn't that we didn't know. So I mean, yeah. I, you know, within the office there was this really exciting chat, you know, with people finding um, finding connections that they hadn't had before. So. Um, if you have a piece, you give it a go. That's right. Yeah, just say well, really well said. And, and for some of you who are paying really close attention, um, you'll notice that there are two trees on the site, right? So we haven't taken away our sort of classic tree. That's still there, but we've started to introduce these, this new, more collaborative tree. Um, you'll see that you'll see that come together. You know, to Tamsin's point, is it's been iterative, but um, but as as we've really started to to do more work on that tree, those tree to tree hints, as Tamsin said, it, think think about hundreds of millions of tree nodes that have been you know sort of compiled the best in the British Isles, but sort of locked away and now being unlocked uh, and sort of unleashed on people's trees. And the feedback has just been amazing. Yeah. Do you want to talk to us about? your uh, arrangement with Living DNA? I might give that to Ben. Happy to. <laughs> that DNA business. Yeah, it, and, and let me just ask this. Is there, is there just a talk in general about it or more specifically? Well, I'd tested with Living DNA long before your collaboration, but a friend of mine used the system to upload her data and she was very disappointed with how little information she got. So she sent me, charged me with seeing if there was a special on it here to buy a full kit to do the full test. She found that just the upload very disappointing. Yeah, that's a, that's fair feedback. There's two, so there's two things that I would say. One is is you know as a as a company, and Tamsin talked about this in, in you know her, her talk earlier today. Uh, we're very very partnership oriented. Um, we don't believe we have to do it all by ourselves. In fact, we don't believe anyone can do do it really by themselves. And so, you know, we'll partner with with the National Archives First Library, and that's similar to what we've done with Living DNA. Is we partner to bring sort of the best together. And so, a lot of what we what we've done on DNA is how can we take what they've got that sort of high definition ethnicity estimate for for you know British and Irish ancestry, and then how can we bring find my past data and records into that. And now, tree? Uh, and, and in the future, we'll talk more, not yet, but in the future more about that. Now, the upload discussion is interesting, right? Um, we, we actually, when we initially launched it, we weren't actually going to do anything with uploads. And we said, you know what, let's build this functionality and feature. We did no marketing, nothing. And, and the, the response, though, just having that feature there um, was a bit overwhelming, right? <laughs> I mean, without going into specific mm -hmm. numbers, I'll just say we were very surprised there. Um, you know, but I think you're also right. We haven't done as much for those sort of upload individuals. What we what we basically said is, is if you'd like to share your data, we'll be working to, to provide features in the future. Um, we you know we didn't ask anybody to pay anything for it. Um, you know, and, and at the same time, it's really been for us a discussion about about how do we spend our time in those areas that that you know you you sort of can't do it all. So. 
um, we haven't forgotten about it. We, you know, we're not saying we're not going to do anything, but but our challenge right now is so there. There are so many opportunities, um, you know, sort of in front of us. It's how do we provide the, the most benefit to, to the most number of customers? And again, that's where you look at something like Tree to Tree Hints. That was very obvious. It was a very obvious opportunity. And so when you have to make trade-offs between those two, you do the thing that will help the most people. Um, and at the same time, it doesn't mean that we're giving up on, on sort of uploads. Does that, does that help? Mm -hmm. When you work with Find My Past and you're a customer of Find My Past, not all companies acquire and digitize and publish records in the same way. So, um, you know, Find My Past, I'll just, I'll just tell you how we, we do it. If it's a family history society, if it's an archive that's produced it, they retain the copyright, um, and as it's published on Find My Past, they get paid a royalty. Um, we want to see those organizations be healthy and grow. Um, and so, you know, the, the model that we work on is, is we say, listen, you know, we're in this together. Your data is your data. We're going to license it from you. And as we're successful, you're going to be successful as well. And, and the interesting thing is every time we get a chance to have that conversation with an archive, um, you know, we, we may not be the biggest, but but when when the conversation is about, you know, sort of how, how can my archive be healthy, how can I preserve the records right, um, we win those conversations almost every single time. Uh, and the trick is really getting in and have, and being able to have that conversation. And so uh, I, I would just sort of add that is, is not all records that are put online are created equal. And, and it's helpful to know that, you know, um, you know, I see, for example, the you know, sort of, sort of Federation of Family History Societies. We work very closely with them and, again, work to very sort of, sort of financially support them at, uh, as we publish the records. Is that so, speakers, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah, and others. And others. But yes. This question is, what, what can we find, what information can we find in the 1921 census that, that, that they were like, uh, It's hugely interesting. So the 1921 census is the first time that place of location of work is captured. So in addition to where you live and who's living in the household with you, and you can also start to overlay that with, with also the non-familial collection, connections that you'd have in a workplace. What factory or shop did you work in? Where's that location? And who were the other people who were going there with you every day? Right. So that, I mean, that's hugely interesting. So it gives you the same social history across the top. And we're excited about that. Of course, it connects in with um, the newspaper archive as well, the British newspaper archive, and, and and the history we can then get about workplaces and. And organizations from that as well. We think it will provide a really, a, a really rich uh, layer to, um, to uh, over the top of the facts. Um, yeah. Go she's going to ask because I don't have She wants to know how, how, what, how Find My Past finds Roots Tech London and the opportunities that it's opened up for you, and just maybe speak a little bit more about how the parents here in London. It, it's just brilliant that we took this here in London for the first time. I know it was an absolutely huge thing that was pulled off, but it is it is like roots tech, right? I mean the, the, the professionals and the fluidity, the great talks and presentations and keynotes and, and stands and everyone's here. I mean all of you are here, right? Um, it's just wonderful and you know, the UK has this um, it's just such a rich local history. There's, it's a small island and there's so much history in each small part of it. And I think this focus on just having Roots Tech here really helps bring that out, you know, out of the light, out of the open for us to, to talk about that, explore that, find different ways of helping people kind of connect into, connect into that part. So I just, you know, think it, it could be more wonderful and um, it's been a, you know, fantastic couple of days. Uh, for us to meet so many people here, not be jet lagged, it's you know nice as well, and um, you know we're, we're just um, really you know really delighted that, that Roots Tech is here. Can I just add to that too? I mean, you you think about going to Roots Tech in Salt Lake, and Roots Tech in Salt Lake is great. I'm from Salt Lake, um, but but you think about you know you can go to the Family History Library, do additional research. Here, you know, you can do additional research, but then go experience it, right? Go find, you know, the, 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 the county or the town or even better, the flat where your ancestors came from. 
you can't do that very many other places. Um, and and it just, it's such a unique experience um, that, that I, I just, you know, I, I think it's, it's ideal. It's the churches that I always think are amazing because that when you get to the parish records, yes. right, you know, each one is from a parish and those parishes exist and, uh, you know, most of those churches are still there and yes. you've been looking at this name, uh, you know, that often comes through the family for so many generations and then to see that church and often see the gravestones and so on, I mean, it is, it's, it's thrilling, right? So. Yeah. Back to the 2021 yeah. census, sorry. Um, can you say anything about the subscription model that will be used? I know that you were the first with the 1911 and also the 1939. So can I guess that it will be similar-ish? Yeah, happy to take this one. So it'll be similar, similar-ish. Um, so, so with 1911 and 1939, um, there was a pay-per-view model um, that was that was in place. Um, and you know, we we then, after a period of time, rolled it into the subscriptions. Um, we're not ready to announce sort of final details on this, and, and but I will tell you, you will see some similar ideas. And, and you might say, you know, why, why don't you just put it in a subscription day one, right? Come on. Um, uh, as part of working with our archive partners, um, the National Archives is really interested and, and sort of committed to making sure as many people can get access to that record as possible. And so one of the things, for example, that, that they were concerned about is, I don't want to have to have everyone have a subscription to get access to this valuable data, right? And so that's, you know, if you, if you think about it, um, you, you might look at it and say, oh, that was maybe a commercial decision. Um, it's really a decision about how do you get the most people to have access to that and have the most benefit. And, and, and you know, they're committed to that, we're committed to that in partnership with them. So you'll see some, some uh, big similarities, though, without going into exact details. And just to add, too, there was a question that, you know, just to add on what Tamsin said about, you know, the, the sort of uh, occupation and workplace in, in 1921. I think the other, uh, this is maybe an obvious answer, but the other thing you'll find in 1921 is, is you will find, number one, more people, of course, than in 1911, but you'll also find this, bri this bridge, right? Because now you have 1911, 1921, 1939, and you look at how much movement was happening during that time, um, and we have many people who get lost, um, and it's sort of that really key missing piece, right? Um, the other thing, just as a sort of plug on 1939, you've seen 1939 maybe show up in a few other places on a few other websites. One of the things that's unique about Find My Past, and, and this will be true for 1921 as well, is in, in 1939 there, there are still some living people in that register. Um, and you know we protect their privacy, but we actually release new names on 1939 every single day. So there are new people added to the 1939 register on Find My Past every day as those privacy as those privacy dates expire, new people get added. So, again, just because you've looked at 1939 once, um, it, you know, don't think that they're that they're there. New people are added, and that only happens on Find My Past. No one else has a copy uh, that releases every single day that way. So, yeah, five million new names since it was released. So just as a small plot. And I'd add to that the you know, 21 is finding of that the kind of migration that you saw after after 21 after World War One um, is going yeah, to be is really interesting as we look at the US and the collections there. We you know we're quite excited about what people will be able to discover about that generation. Uh, yeah, no, it's it's a good question. So it's a really really good question, and and I, and I you know I'm with you. I don't think anyone would defend some of the citations in the past. We've we've actually just gone through kind of a top to bottom analysis of all of our records to say to say how would we how would we describe these in a consistent way and in an, and in a you know so so that if you're looking at this at, at a similar type record collection um, it's not you know this is world war 1 the great war first world war you know uh, and and so we can really give you consistent citations we're in the process of starting to, to roll those out. So those standards have been all developed so that we can provide better citations. By the way, it also provides better searching and better and, and better hinting over time as you have more consistent sort of structure to that data. We're just in the process of starting to roll that out. So you're not gonna see it right away. The, the way that we'll roll it out is on our most used record collections, you'll see that first. We will eventually roll it out to all of the collections, but that will improve the citations as well. Yes. Um, a transcript, yes. not an image, which I 
it's not really yeah no it's not it's not helpful it doesn't tell you what you need it, it would never it would never be acceptable yeah. yes yes that's yes. exactly right so, so the, those would be sort of British records here, yes so it is it is being it is being addressed um, yeah. thank you helping that keep us there's there's um, so the way to think about the way to think about the newspapers, um, it, it's an interesting situation. It's, it's not so much a privacy situation, but it's who owns the copyright, right? And and so you know there are a number of current newspaper publishers, um, uh, you know, who and, and their point of view is we, we you know we own the copyright. This is our this is our data, and we want to be very respectful of that. Um, and so we work very closely with the British Library on things that are out of copyright. But for things that are in copyright, we've started to work, uh, and, and, and prior, I wanted to say, if you, if you were to look at the British Newspaper Archive uh, two and a half, three years ago, you would only see out of copyright data, right? They're talking 50 years. Yes, yeah. only out of copyright. And so, but if you look now, um, we've actually gone directly to these publishers, and much in the same way we've worked with family history societies, we've said, listen, we'd like to actually publish your data, we respect your copyright, um, and we have a number of publishers that are starting to work with us. Um, there's a there's one we're not quite ready to announce, but you'll see data on the British newspaper archive through current day um, and sort of modern modern data because they've seen the value of, of having that data on on the site. Um, it doesn't feel competitive to them. They're, you know, they're they're still able to sell newspapers, but they see the value for family historians and, and researchers as well. And so. You know, we're having a number of conversations with publishers. Uh, like I said, some of the largest publishers are, have already tipped in, um, and we'll do more of that in the, in the future. But it really is out of respect for the, the copyright um, that's there, and, and trying to work with our partners in a way that um, you know that works for them and works for us.